we can't say, so I'm going to be this ethical person and I'm never going to ask even a difficult question because I don't want my customer to feel badly. And that's not realistic either. That's why we have to remember that when we're selling and asking more difficult questions, we're not being mean, we're being merciful. This is Outside Sales Talk, the best podcast for outside salespeople. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and we're here to chat with the world's top sales experts so that you can get their best sales tactics to level up your game. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. Today, we're going to talk about the art of persuasion and influence in sales. I've got Robert Jollis with us, who's an expert in the topic. Welcome to the show, Rob. Ah, it's good to be here. I'm glad to have been invited in. Absolutely. So by way of introduction, Rob Jollis is a sought after speaker. And after a, a very successful sales career, he became a sales coach and has been the author of a number of best selling books, such as How to Change Minds, The Art of Influence Without Manipulation, Why People Don't Believe You, Building Credibility from the Inside Out, and Customer Centered Selling, Sales Techniques for a New World Economy. So we'll be exploring the themes of his books today and hopefully sucking as much knowledge out of his brain for you guys as possible. So, uh, oh, and also I should mention that Rob is also the host of his own podcast, Pocket Sized Pep Talks. So if you like what he's saying, that's another great place to hear from him. So Rob, the tagline of one of your books is the art of influence without manipulation. What is... Where do you draw the line between influence and manipulation? Yeah, I'll tell you a funny story as we get there because it's one word. And uh, I remember when I was, you know, sort of had this epiphany, like, I'm going to be the guy that really explains this. I remember like, that's it. There's the word. And then I thought, well, I got about 40,000 more words I'm going to need to come up with to surround that one word. But but the, the word we're looking for is intent. And, um, you know, it, it's it, a couple of reviews weren't so hot. I mean, the book got reviewed very nicely, but a few of them people struggled because they said he spends so much time on this intent. But the reason why I do it is because it's not like there's two parallel sales processes, one when your intent is good and one when your intent is bad, meaning I'm going to sell this because I need it. I don't care if you need it. See, that's not good. So because there are not two different sales processes, I actually felt a responsibility when I wrote the book to spend time and to really, uh, throughout the book, even in opening tactics, objection handling, look for moments to say, now, nah, if we say it that way, that's going to, that, our intent's off. If we say it this way, just because I knew that in a, in a sense, I could be training people with bad intentions, <laughs> how to manipulate. And I didn't want to do it, but it's really intent. If what I've got, I believe is really right for you. And I mean, I, I really know this is right then I'm going to deploy all options available to me. And someday you're going to shake my hand, but I know you fear change. And I know I'm going to have to push a little bit. My intent is good. I feel good. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you know, I, and I feel like this has become all the more important in the modern world. Like that, like so many people's websites sound so similar, like, Oh, we're going to make your sales. Like in my industry, you're going to make, we're going to make your sales process better, or we're going to, help you sell more. And it's like, well, if everyone's doing that, I, I, I think it's it's more important to be like, here is the specific thing that we do. And here is specifically how we do it. And here's a video of us doing it. So and I, I think you want to do that all before anyone's even talked to, to a salesperson, right? Because then, then you're already, you know, relatively aligned, like they understand what you do, who you do it for, am I a good fit? What, how do you specifically do it? Like, if you only do it on, you know, I if you only do it on iOS and I know my Salesforce all, all has Androids, then I know we're not a good fit, right? Like I don't we we don't have to talk, but I, I think the, what you're saying is so important. Yeah, I always, you know, I I was the guy. I mean, I, I wrote sort of the Great American Sales Book in uh, you know the late '90s, and it came out in a new edition. That's the Customer Centered Selling Book. And, you know, if you're a card carrying salesperson, have at it. I, I, I threw everything but the kitchen sink, even when Simon and Schuster said, we, you know, when I write another one, I kept saying, I haven't changed my mind. I, I, when we got to the second edition, it's the first sentence in the second edition. I haven't changed my mind. But we in sales, we're, we, there's so many people that are in positions, managers, 
parents, so many people who don't even like the word selling. And so when we start talking about how to change minds and we take the dollar sign off the book cover for a minute and we talk about the moral implication of persuasion, now we open that up to those who have looked down their nose at selling and, and say to them, maybe you want to take a look because you sell every day. We're tired of telling you that. But how about we just talk about where you're hung up, which is not what you're doing. It's why you're doing it. And let's have a conversation there. And then I can't wait to tell you how to do it. But I always felt, I kind of came back and thought, that's what's missing. We don't spend enough time talking about why we're doing this. And that's the idea of trying to separate intent, et cetera, and really flush that out a little bit. Well, I, I think great salespeople, the ones who will have the most successful careers are, are at their hearts educators. And so they're, they're working with a great product they're, and they fi they've figured out who the product benefits. And then their job is to educate people about that and really help them prioritize, coach, coach them on how to prioritize their lives to get this thing that is really beneficial to them rather than manipulating someone into not, not uh, the, manipulating someone into buying something that they don't really need or wouldn't be the best fit for them. Because ultimately, and certainly this is, you know, in any recurring relationship, it, you know, maybe this isn't true if you're selling used cars, but because that could be just be a one-time sale. But like even the most successful star, car salesman, I, we had a, one of the most successful Lexus car salesmen in the country on the podcast a, a while back. And, uh, and, and even there, like, he's like, I don't actually, he's, he, he doesn't work that often because he's like, I, I come in for appointments with people who have purchased from me before. Like I, I, I'm so, I, I come in to sell you your fourth Lexus. I'm not here to sell you your first. Like, yeah. Like yeah. He's, and, and Grant, he's like, oh, he's older in his career and stuff. So it kind of makes sense. Like he's like, I'm just, you know, cult. but he's reaping the benefits of having been, you know, an ethical salesperson throughout his career. And, and uh, so I think it's about education rather than manipulation. And, and yeah, what, what do you think about that? People say sales is a manipulative prof profession by nature. Can can a salesperson, in your opinion, be ethical and still have a a, a, a good and lucrative career? That was me falling out of my chair on that question. <laughs> yes, of course we can, uh, but we can't sugarcoat it either. We can't we can't say so. I'm going to be this ethical person, and I'm never going to ask even a difficult question because I don't want my customer to feel badly. And that's not realistic either. That's why we have to remember that when we're selling and asking more difficult questions, we're not being mean. We're being merciful. And you know, if I could, I'm just going to double back because it seemed like we had almost a kumbaya moment about well, we got intent out there. So no one, no one it, who's decent is going to push a client into a decision they wouldn't make for themselves. And yet I could draw some scenarios and say, how about it's uh, two weeks before the end of the fiscal year and you're two sales away from a $25,000, $50,000 bonus. And XYZ customer walks up in front of you who doesn't really need that product. Or maybe you're in a sales contest right now. And you're just sniffing at first prize and you're this. And uh, so I, I have empathy for those who are what we would call in training unconsciously incompetent, meaning they're not really willingly doing it, but they're pushing a little bit. I just I just didn't want to sugarcoat intent and say, well, you know, so if you're good, you won't do it. And if you're bad, you will. We, we all, including Rob Jollis, um, have been at that line before and been tempted and occasionally dipped our foot over the line. At New York Life, I was in a contest once, it was called Steak and Beans. The first half of the, we had, I think, 20 apprentice field underwriters. The first half, if you came in the top 10, you went to the manager's house and had steak. Uh, spouses and significant others were mandatory. And if you were in the bottom 10, you came to that same thing with your spouse or significant other, and you not only served it to them, you stood in the kitchen and ate beans with your significant other. Oh, now, no. your got a little Glen Gary, Glen Ross to it. Put that coffee down. Yeah, a yeah, little bit of that plus your spouse is serving is eating beans. And that's that's you're tough. eating beans. Yeah, way to go, Rob. You're one heck of a salesperson, and you're close to that line. So I, I, I'm ready to dance off that. I just want you to know that 
Uh, sometimes our own processes within the company are pushing people in decisions that they wouldn't normally make. Now, you brought up a Lexus guy you had on who's been in the business. He's got a nice book of business. We're all geniuses if we could survive 20 or 30 years in our business. And people come to me all the time. I'm, I'm coming up on 40 years as a professional speaker. And they go, how do you do away with all it? Well, it's called bits, butts in the seats. But when you've done it for a while, like the Lexus salesperson, I have clients. So I wouldn't call myself every day out there being the greatest salesperson. I'm talking right now to somebody who's listening to your podcast and doesn't have that book of business and needs to get going on this thing. So, um, you know, that's, that's important to me. Um, okay. And, and so what is the role of, of trust when you're influencing people? How, how do we, how do we get prospects to believe that we're trustworthy? That was me falling out of my chair yet again on the trust question. It's everything. And, and I have to tell you, back in uh, when I worked for Xerox, we put a model together. It had 22 steps to it. And, uh, it was, you know, Xerox, very process-oriented company. And, and yet, the only thing, and I'm embarrassed to tell you, I was part of that team. The only thing we didn't do is we didn't put any steps in there for trust or anything. We just went, well, you're not going to do that. I mean, obviously, create trust. That's step one. And my goodness, if you can't create trust, I could take you through a three-week sales class. I'll be wasting your time uh, because the rest of the process becomes anemic. Uh, the most difficult part about trust, actually, is it's one of the few pieces that's hard to put a repeatable, predictable process behind. So create urgency. We can create, um, you know, uh, like opening tactics, subjection, alien, but we react, you know, react to personalities. I got processes for just about everything in my head, but trust is is all important. Nothing, and I think the reason why people struggle is because it's not as easy to say do this, this, and this, and now you will be trusted. Um, it's it's more of what you're doing and and how you're doing it. I don't mind dissecting that with you if you'd like, but don't count on that's your process because it isn't there. Yeah, I, and I started my career at IBM and did their sales school, which is very similar to to, uh, to Xerox in a lot of ways culturally. But the the uh, for, from what I've heard, but uh, rapport was one of the I I, I, for, I don't remember the acronym anymore, but the R for rapport. And, and trust was a part of that, I guess, was uh, was was very high, very early in the in the how do we sell list of things to do. And, you know, it's funny, we keep circling back to intent, one of your earlier points. But I, I, I think I, I think that intent is so important with building rapport, or building trust, because if your intent is 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 not the customer's best interest, I, I, I think people can smell it. I think people can people have instincts and, you know, there and and you know obviously this is a podcast for field salespeople huge advantage for field and outside salespeople over people selling inside um over the phone or something when you sit down in front of someone it's so much easier to build rapport and or get them to trust you if you're a trustworthy person and you actually have their if you, if you have their interest in mind because i think people's in, instincts our whole life you know since since we played Monopoly with our older brother when we were seven years old and he was cheating, like we can tell when people are screwing us. We can tell, we can smell it when people are, are uh, not being truthful or not being transparent or not acting with integrity. I think we, we have great instincts for this. Um, and maybe it's, maybe it's hardwired into being humans, not just something that we've learned from our older brother, but, uh, but you know, the, the uh, there's a lot of reasons why we'd be good at this. And I think people are good at it. And so if your intents are malicious or if your intents aren't the customer's best interest, I think they can tell. And if you're sitting in front of them, I think they can really, they can feel it and they can, they can tell that you are trustworthy. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd like to agree with that, but, but I struggle with it. I think that there are people out there that are very good at, um, at being deceptive. It just is the way it is. And oh, by the way, you know, who falls prey to them first? Salespeople. <laughs> so true. Right. So. We're the easiest one. We want to bond. We're naturally looking to bond because that's what we do when we sell. And so when another salesperson reaches out the bond, we think it's us. We, we, you know, my wife has to watch me 
when I'm with salespeople and, and literally pull on my dad and I, Rob, that's not your dad, Rob. You're, <laughs> you don't have to help him, Rob. Uh, so I, I want them to be successful. So I think it's, 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 it's more challenging than you might imagine. You know, the, the funny thing is, and I'm not just dropping in books here, but this, this last book I, I wrote, it wasn't supposed to be called Why People Don't Believe You, by the way. It was supposed to be called It's Not the Words, It's the Tune. And what happens is publishers, when they get a hold of a manuscript, we authors typically own what's inside, but the publishers own kind of own what's outside and they usually know what they're doing, even though we think we know more. Right. But I, I mentioned that because I think the tune has a lot to do with trust. Yeah, you know, I think the not what yeah, we tell say. Us, but tell us what say. you mean when you say yeah. that. I mean uh the pitch, the pace that we're speaking, the pauses we take. Uh, you know, uh, I, I I quote a lot of people, but I'm gonna quote the great oh me. I'm going to quote Rob Joss on this one when I say, uh, I, yeah, let me tell you, authors, a lot of times we're writing going, I, I think that's okay. I guess that's all right. This one I, I wrote, I went, I love that. Because, and what I wrote was this one sentence where it said, it's not the words, it's the spaces between the words that betray us. And um, so when I say the tune, I'm referring to the spaces in between. I'm referring to, I could read off a piece of paper and tell you, we have the best product there is in, in the universe. Okay, but you see the tune is, it's, it's, that doesn't sound right. We have the best product in the universe. Um, now, I, I could do it four other times, but you hear I'm starting to move the pitch around. I'm starting to slow it down. Mm -hmm. So I, it's funny, I, you know, I guess I'm done with my trilogy, but I know there's sales process out there. Yay, we've got them. Uh, I also wanted to say, let's take a step back and figure out what our intent is and really start driving a line between us. So here's how to sell. Here's why we sell. But we had to start, I had to start dropping back and going, well, why are some people that I train just not getting a hang of this? I'm, I, I practically wrote it down for them. Here, just say that. Because they don't have the tune. It's like being tone deaf almost. And, and quite frankly, this experiment that I ran for about eight years was not with salespeople. I went into a room to speak one time in front of, I thought it was going to be like 10, about 250 people in career transition and, and gave a presentation and was so moved. I spent the next decade in that room every week. And I had my own little Petri dish. And I realized that some people, they come in, they, they, they're in between jobs, blink, and they're going to have the next job. But what about the chronic person? What about that person? And that's the one that can't make the sound that we, we tell them. Now, all you got to do is be authentic. OK, what does that sound like? And it's it's like playing a note and they and you go bing and they go, ha, they go, no, no, listen to the note. They can't hear it. So we have to begin to help them understand how to hear the sounds of what authenticity sounds like. And I'm circling back and I'm saying, isn't that a part of lot, a, a big part of trust as well? Do I believe you? You know, and, and, and we don't teach that a whole lot in our sales training classes. Well, I, I think one of the keys here, is I, I always advise salespeople, sell something you really believe in. Like if you, if you are selling lasers and you know that there's, and you really in your heart believe that your competitor laser, laser product is just a better product. And it's a mistake for your customers to buy it. And you could be wrong. You could be right. But let's just assume you're right because you're an expert in the laser industry. If you believe that, you should switch companies and start selling the better laser because you're never going to succeed selling something you don't believe in. Like you have to, in your heart, you know, authentically believe it. And that authenticity comes across in your voice and it comes across in your presence and, 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 and just, you know, get you out of bed in the morning. If you feel like you're, you know, I, th I think it's hard to, to to uh, you know be trustworthy and be authentic uh, if you aren't if you aren't selling something you truly believe in you know now i'm 100 percent locked in with you i love that and i i, I hope people play that one again i mean I, you got to <laughs> hear that you know before we went on the air if it's okay we were talking about a couple things and we talked about you know the tried and true we got to ask questions and listen and you know there's a lot of things here but if I were asking you what's the most important thing about sales, I, I'd use your words. 
I would say just what you said, which is, well, it all starts with, you know, you want other people to believe you, you better believe you. And, um, and that means you've got to believe in your product. Now, that said, we can't all represent Lexus. We can't all represent the top of the line. So what we need to do is understand what our branding is, who we're appealing to, and, 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 and accept that and believe that. And then I can sell it. I'll give you a real fast story. I made a commitment when I went into become a, a professional speaker that I was never going to speak to an audience whose product I didn't believe in. And, uh, and that's pretty easy when you're handling your own business, but I get booked out by speakers bureaus. And one time, don't worry, I'm not going to nail this, this industry to just a little side swipe, not a big deal. But I got a call and they said, yeah, we want to hire you to go down to Florida and speak to a big national conference of timeshare salespeople. Well, I had been, you know, I stopped in on a couple of timeshares before and I wasn't getting five star properties. That's all I can tell you. And they weren't really good. And I immediately decided, dang, hey, we timeshares and none of them are any good. Well, shame but, on me. Time, That's not accurate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some, yeah, so, some, there's some cool new businesses in the space of like, you know, they're creating an LLC around like a piece of property and they're dividing it. Exactly. Up people. There, there's some interesting stuff around there. Although, I think the industry has been maligned because historically a lot of the businesses are like, well, we're going to send you, sell you this piece of property for $800,000. It's actually worth 200, <laughs> but because we're selling it to 50 of you at a time. Oh, there are maintenance issues. There's all kinds of things. Yeah. But the point is what I had to do is kind of figure out, well, wait a minute. Is, you know, is there a calling for this just because I'm a snob or whatever I am and decide oh, I'm too good for timeshare. All of a sudden, I'm looking at people that can't purchase a second home and love to go to Rehoboth Beach. I'm, I'm on the East Coast. That's my, that's my beach. Matter of fact, I've taken my family there 34 straight years. If I could go into the Wayback Machine, I'd have bought a timeshare 30, 34 years ago. I would have been the perfect customer. So once we determine, wait a minute, there's a niche, there's a clientele, and I understand it, I don't have to be on the top of the food chain. To do what you said, which is to believe in what I'm selling. But we do have to sit down and, and figure that out because without it, uh, it just eats away at us. Makes a ton of sense. Um, Rehoboth Beach, is, uh, that, that's like near D.C., right? Yeah. If, you're, if you live in the Maryland, Virginia, D.C. area, you go to Rehoboth or Ocean City or Dewey Beach. But a shout out to Rehoboth. It's a, it's a great little beach. And I... Uh, I love it there. Awesome. I've never been myself, but that sounds great. Um, so I've heard you talk about how people are resistant to change. What do you think? What's that all about? Why are people so resistant to, to change? And, and how can you, if you're a salesperson, successfully sell to a prospect that's resistant to change? Yeah. And other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the show? Um, yeah, uh, because it's natural, because the 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 pain of the present doesn't exceed, you know, the fear of the unknown. And so a lot of times what we find is that people don't naturally fix small problems. They fix big problems. That's the way customers are wired. And we are wired, many of us in sales, unfortunately are wired. Give me just a hint of a problem that you have are actually admitting to that I can fix. And here we go. It's features and benefits time. I'm going to solve it for you. And uh, so, uh, one, that's why. And two, yeah, there's a process. And I basically, in a sense, I have, I have centered my career on this process. I'm, I'm, I, I can handle objections like anyone else. I can do a lot of different things. But when you work for Xerox, you, are, you become a green beret in how to create urgency. Because we sold products, copiers, printers, whatever, we saw products and still, problems still do. I've been going from Xerox for 30 years now, but you knew two things about Xerox when we unlocked each door. One, uh, I'm probably going to have the, the best product out there, uh, and it's going to be 20% more than anyone else's. And two, I'm going to be well-trained. Uh, we, we, you don't buy a Xerox product because it would be nice to have. You buy it because you need to have it. So we worked harder on anything else at Xerox of, well, we can't wait for this problem to become bigger. 
Um, why can't we have a conversation about it? And what would that sound like? So I think we all know that we're going to create trust. That's you know, and and oh by the way, that's open to any questions and don't jump on the problem so fast and 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 actively listen. But when we create urgency, when we start moving people over that fear of change, we don't just identify the problem. Uh, we don't just get into a conversation of yes, my you know my car doesn't run as well as I'd like and it breaks down now and then. Well, with Lexus, you won't have to. No. I want to hear how often it breaks down. I want to hear who's driving you to work when it does break down. I want to hear how that impacts the children while you're doing that. I want to hear about the costs that have been involved in this. And, and what I'm doing is I'm not going to solve it for you. If you were that smart, you would have solved it already. The greatest thing I can do as a salesperson, when I've earned the right to be able to talk about that issue of yours, not being on the word problem, quite frankly, uh, is not leave it because because you've told me is to is to ask three or four more questions about it and this requires mental agility this that this this is the part you can't write out before you get there this is where you're going to have to listen and trust your instinct and pause and form another question just like we do at starbucks you know that's more natural when we're talking to friends hey i got an idea why don't we pretend our customers are friend let's have that conversation when your friend tells you they're having an issue at work, you go, okay, that's enough. Here's what you got to do. <laughs> Where do you go? They're not listening to you. Well, what do you do? It's natural. Let's do that with our customers. Such fantastic advice. You know, don't jump into your, 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 your features too quickly, your product too quickly. That's it's such it. And we're, we're pulled towards that. But you as salespeople, because we want to move, we want to move fast and, and, and uh, get things done. But, really hearing people out, really empathizing, really putting yourself in their shoes. Um, it, talk a little bit about that. How, how do you step into the shoes of your prospect? How do you, how do you really empathize with their perspective? What, what tips and thoughts do you have around that for, yeah. for our listeners? All right, I'm going to get old school. First of all, you're going to have to shut up and listen. Okay. Even if you know the answer to the questions, uh, let the client paint the picture. Let the client tell you, you know, you know, I, I wrote a piece once. I'm not telling you this is a, a, a great um, question for everyone, particularly not a dominant client, but I'm going to give you sort of the poster child. I've always loved and I've learned this from a, a buddy of mine in Florida who always starts the same way. Everybody has a story. I'd love to hear yours and really sit back and let them tell you their story. You know, you mentioned that, that, you know, terms of, hey, we could run to features and benefits and stuff, which is the instinct. You're absolutely right. Uh, but we're even fooled that that's going to make us faster. It doesn't make us faster. It makes us slower because until I trust you, I'm not going to tell you about the problems I'm having. Why would I? I'm going to I'll never be able to get you off the phone or out of my office. Uh, but once I give you the gift of trusting you to tell you that this is what's keeping me up at night. Um, why would you leave that? Why would you, why would you disrespect that? Um, so we don't have to look at it as, you know, uh, even me, guys like me, you know, we've called it sometimes opening up a wound and, you know, things like that. Well, yeah, that's a metaphor. Right? Um, but I do. I think it's one of the, the kindest things you can do for another individual. So I think it's actually more instinctive. I just if I'm going to walk in the client's shoes, I've got to before I unleash that urgency. Got to discipline myself to let them tell me their story. And if they're dominant, it'll be a quick story. <laughs> and if they're social, it'll be a longer story. Want to cut them off? You go ahead. I'm not. Uh, but that's it. It's keeping those questions open. It's not an interrogation. It's letting them, like, like a fishing line, let that line just run around the lake for a while. We're in no hurry to start reeling anything in. That's how you walk in a client's shoes. Makes a ton of sense. It's, and I think a lot of people struggle with this step because by nature, I think some of the best salespeople are impatient and uh, you know, focused on the result and result driven and uh, you know, naturally good at creating urgency. Uh, but to really build trust, to really understand your customer, you have to you have to be patient. You have to ask the questions, the, the open-ended questions, let the answer um, 
I'd let the full answer cut out, cut, come out of their mouths and then, and then, you know, reflect on that answer and go deeper with them with those harder, those really hard to come up with four questions you talked about. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's almost against some of our natures. It's certainly against, you know, a, it's against my nature in a lot of ways. Like, I'm like, okay, I've heard this conversation a hundred times before. I know where we're going. Let me, let me cut to the chase. <laughs> let me, let me. But, but, but we have to, we have to slow down and let it all come out or else you, you jeopardize that trust. You, and, and, and yeah. you show you don't really understand their, where they're coming from. Yeah. I mean, the good news is you could stop them, cut them off and tell them, look, this isn't my first law firm, law firm. You're my vertical market. I've been in your law firm for 10 years. I'll tell you how this firm works. And you'll probably get it right, by the way. Now, the good news is you'll be the smartest person in the room. Bad news is no one's going to buy anything from you. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to amend just one move real fast. When we talk about walking in their shoes, there's one other move. I, I want to stay away from the problem when I'm there. I'm not asking them about the football game on Sunday. I'm, I, I, I want to hear about their business. Uh, and, you know, I know that you, we've got a lot of outside salespeople listening here. So we might be visiting that office. Let's let's jump into the financial industry. Maybe we're a wholesaler um, coming in and, and visiting, uh, you know, some, some brokers. Uh, obviously, if there's no problem, there's no need. If there's no need, there's no solution. No solution. I don't get my features and benefits. But don't even jump at the problem so fast. Just let them tell you about their business, about their client, a typical day. What, who, how. Um, I wish people would understand that the moment you drop in and what kind of difficulties are you having or what sort of challenges are you having? Yeah, I desperately want to get there, but you jump the gun, you're going to make that customer and you haven't really earned it. That's not walking in the customer's shoes. Now you've just showed your fangs and you, you've got to be careful. So open-ended, sit back and listen. And don't introduce problems, right? Even, last thing, but even if they bring it up, and, I, and, and this takes some discipline. That's why I still carry a pad of paper when I'm sitting in front of a client. But I, if they bring it up on their own, I, I'm all ears. I'm like, well, let me make sure we get that because I want to make sure that we won't lose this one. I just want to make sure I've got a full understanding of your business first. Yeah, that's right. I'm still not getting dragged out into that because once we go there, it's hard to go back to those trust-based questions. So let's stay there. Let's earn it. Let's hold that one. Let them know we're going to get there. And oh, by the way, let's find one or two more they don't give everybody who comes in to sell them. Uh, that's where the sale is going to be made. Yeah, this is such important advice and, and hard to do. It's 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 hard when someone, especially when someone dangles the the carrot in front of you and you know, of, of hey, I, I have a problem in your area. You want to be like, oh, 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 <laughs> solution, solution. I have it. I have it. Let me tell you about this. These features. Uh, it, it's it's so it, it's so hard to just keep stepping about, stepping back, and really get to know their business, really get to know them, and and then it's very easy to jump back in, especially if they've given you that that way in. You can be like, and you mentioned that. Let's talk about that. Oh, like that. Yeah. But it's hard to do, but it's, I think it's really, really important. One, one, one thing I like to try to do, or I advise people to do is I don't get to, I don't get to go out and sell the customers very much anymore, but the, the, uh, although it's my, it's my favorite part of the job, but I, I don't get to do it a lot, but the, the, uh, the, I, I think it's, it's really important to be an expert in your customer's industry. And that way, if you, cause it, and it's and it's a natural thing that happens over time. If you sell to dentists, over time, you know a ton about dent, the the dental industry. If you've taken these guys out to dinner and you know talk to their assistant and talk to the hygienist, and you just you go try to go as deep as you can into as many parts of their business as if you're about to open your own dental firm, right? Yeah. And 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 so when kind of things that have nothing to do with your solution come up and because you've talked to a hundred dentists, you know a lot about their, you know, they could be having a problem with parking and how to deal with the local, you know, their, their landlord, with the park with parking issues, all these people coming and going all the time. And, you know, you, if you can, if you can speak about that problem or, or give examples of how these three people, other dentist offices have taken care of that, you know, even something totally having nothing. If you sell lasers, you're talking about parking, that can be a great way to build trust and, and, and build rapport with someone and really go deeper with them because they, 
They know that you're just, you know, create that value and you're not getting anything for it. Like you don't get paid to solve their parking problems. Right. But, right. but uh, you know, you're, you're here to sell lasers really, but, but you know, that's the sort of thing that can come up in these conversations. And you can, if you're a true expert and true, a true consultant in their industry, um, you can provide value all over the place. And then later, you know, later go down the path of what your, what your thing is and, and what you do. Right. Well, you just defined what, you know, uh, some authors will call a trusted business advisor. You want to be a vendor? You want to be a trusted business advisor. A vendor is somebody who sells goods and services. If that client finds it for one penny cheaper, they may very well go to the next vendor. And when you are outraged, you go, well, what happened? Uh, I thought we had something here. They'll go, did we? You're just a vendor. But when you're a trusted business advisor, you're not just a vendor. You're talking about those parking spots too. And maybe you don't know about parking spots, but you're going to go research it for them and find out somebody who does. That's what a trusted business advisor does. And that's one of the ways we really cement ourselves into this account. So A, brilliantly said, I want to be a subject, as much of a subject matter expert as I can. But B, I want to, I want to merge uh, friendship and business and create that TBA. I know I know I have clients that put TBA on their business card that they they want to be the client's trusted business advisor and uh, and and even enter into that conversation. So yeah, I think that's really important. Yeah. I that's that's it's it's more important than people realize I think for the long for <laughs> for, for the long-term relationship. Uh yeah. well, so after after you've built trust, after you've walked around in, in people's shoes and, and, and you can empathize with your with your customer, we the concept of urgency has come up several times. So I guess this is now you've already shown you've built the trust, you've got the empathy, you've, you've talked about your 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 product and the features and the value. How do you create urgency to actually get something done? How do you get people to because I because I think this is a key thing that salespeople yeah. in the modern world do because a lot right. of they pe salespeople used to be a key venue for information about things and they still are but now there's a lot of information out there on on the internet at the, at the tips of our feet, fingers we have all the information man has ever created right but how do you once pe someone has actually nodded their head and they agree yeah, yeah this is something i should probably deal with i would benefit far the benefits would far outweigh the costs on this this is we're better off with this how do you how do you actually get them to do it? How do you create urgency? Got it. Okay. All right. Well, we're merging two words. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Hold half of that because we're going to talk about closing in a minute. But my urgency isn't found when I'm talking about features and benefits. That's what you see on television. Okay. Somebody going, I can get seven reasons why this is good. You know, um, Billy Mays here for OxyClean. You know, that, that's the big pitch nonsense. Okay. Um, urgency is created back. So we talked about creating trust. And then we talked about climbing in and not asking one question about the issue, but five, four, three questions more about that issue. Uh, what's happening is when you, when you uh, allow me to see the potential ramifications of what I'm doing, that's where the energy in this conversation is coming from. But let's go a step further. Let's test it. Let's measure it. I think one of the greatest trial closes, while when we think, I think I want to go to the features and benefits now. I think I actually want to solve this for them. I hope they, they're ready. Why are we guessing? So we all know the, the old trial close, which I'm not totally against, but just not here, of if I could show you a way to solve this and do it better than anyone else, would you? That's called a, a pre-commit, okay? Uh, don't bury it yet, sales world, but let's push that aside. How about a smarter trial close? How about one that fits where the customer is right now, which is on their first decision point? Do you want to fix this or not? I'm not talking about features and benefits yet. I may have to go put a proposal together and bring some resources out here. I want to see where I want to do a temperature read. So I love the trial close when I think I've asked enough questions about that issue of just turning, taking a pause with a closed ended question and saying something to the effect of, are you committed to making a change? Or do you think now's a good time to look at some solutions? Because think about it. And I got seven more, but that's going to be all the same. Yes, no. Do you want to do something about it or not? I didn't walk in and go, hi, how are you? You ready to make a change? Uh, 
I, I not only listened to you, maybe asked a few more questions than most people and got in those shoes, but we found not one, but two issues. And we really explored maybe the cost, the potential of what that could do. I want to just make sure now, do you think it's worthwhile solving this? If a client says no, let's, let's, let's pull that one out as an objection. We'll clarify that one in a minute. But I don't think you're going to get a whole lot of no's there. And once I get that first door closed of yes, I think I do want to fix this. You've just told me, good, we don't have to talk about the problem anymore. Now let's build you the perfect solution. So it's in stages for me. So there's no big guesswork at the close. I've got somebody who wants to fix it. Now let's figure out what it takes to fix it. And sometimes that's still not telling anybody, here's what you need. It's saying, well, you told me that, uh, and let's stay in that financial example. If you, you can give me another one if you want, but you told me that the firm that you're using right now, selling some of your funds, isn't quite as um, attentive as you'd like them to be. Are you looking for something a little bit more, uh, a little bit more consistent? And no, yeah, and I also want something. So well, I'm writing that down. By the way, why can't we trial that when we have a list of exactly what that client wants? And trust me, it's all going to be solutions to the problem you've just been talking about. Now we can turn and hit them again. Is this what it's going to take to make you happy? And if they say, yeah, now I not only have you saying to me, I want it fixed. That's what it's going to take to fix it. Now I'm ready to get my features and benefits. And all I'm going to do is time to what you said now is going to you'll be basing your decision on. So. That, that's why I didn't want to just leave us on an island and go urgency from features and benefits. I've been building urgency for the moment I got into that first question about those challenges you have. And I'm, I'm on it and pushing on it. And that's where it comes from. Makes a ton of sense. And what, what about adaptation? How, how should salespeople, in, in your opinion, adapt themselves to different prospects in different situations? Yeah, I think the first thing they should do is um, be a little more attentive to personality. I'll be the first guy here, my hands in the air. All right, I admit it. When I first started seeing the Myers-Briggs models and the DISC models and the many iterations that have followed, uh, it seemed to always work in four quadrants, but I, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> I really kind of looked down my nose at him. Ah, oh, you know, that's not a sales model. Um, then I had somebody that I hired that was working for me that was certified in both. And I started realizing, not just because I hired her, but you know what? They're not a sales model. But, but how can I ignore the attention to personality? In other words, the study of personality gives me a sense of pacing. It gives me a sense of how fast or slow? Remember when I said everybody has a story? I'd love to hear yours. Say that to a dominant client one time. You're better off dragging your fingers down a chalkboard. What? Just what do you got in the bag? So by understanding personality, and I mean reading personality through an email, through a voice message, maybe through a Zoom call where you're looking at the background of that particular uh, prospect. By understanding whether they're social or analytical or dominant, I know there's many more, but those are the three that I like to live with. Uh, and nobody's just one, but looking for that spike a little bit, it tells me I may not be as analytical, but I'm going to not just say this will reduce costs. I'm going to give them numbers. If I do, again, I, I go into a long story about that with a dominant, I'm going to lose them. They're going to glaze over. I'm, maybe I'm not one who likes to schmooze a lot. Well, a social does. So today I'm schmoozing. Uh, so what, to me, that's a piece that we have to pay attention to. It, it sort of rides shotgun on our sales process, but you could see once again that how can you talk me out of ignoring the personality of the under, other individual? I beat up those models, by the way, because I always took the tests and was obsessed on you know, what I wasn't scoring well on. And, and what I realized, and I kept saying, as long as I sell me for the rest of my life, I'm really good with this test. Then I realized I have to read the personality of others and begin like a chameleon. Many of us do it naturally, but begin to slow down, speed up, bring out those numbers, whatever it is, to begin to, to sew into that client's personality. Um, that's an important piece to me. Yeah, I, I think a lot of these, you know, th these things feel like uh, astrology sometimes, but actually I think they are 
it, it, it does help as a framework to break people into a handful. I mean, the Myers Briggs with their 16 head personality types, I think that's that's a lot to keep in mind. Too but many. It, Too many. At least at least holding holding a a handful of 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 the personalities, you know, the, the, like you're saying, the dominant, the social, the the analytical. I, I have, we recently did a test like this at at uh, at at Badger, just like amongst the employees, and it was interesting to see everyone had everyone's different results, and, and like some some people were really surprised me, like you know, people you can't just go by their by their job title, right? Like the a, a guy that I would on the, on the engineering team that I definitely would have pegged for an analytical turned out to be uh, what one of the other ones. I forget which one that right or what they call it right now, but. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's worth trying to feed, have some framework that you approach your customers with and then, and then, um, and then keeping that in mind, at least breaking people into a handful of what's, and yeah. you can kind of piece it, piece it together, like if by, by having conversations and asking them, Hey, well, what's, what, what would be important for you to understand? What are you looking to get out of this? What, what can I help you with? What? If if you if you want to give me a homework assignment to go learn find something out for you in this area, what would it be like? They they'll lead you down the path of what they need to see, right? Yep, yep. Um, and and you know you made a good point. Uh, Myers Briggs is a brilliant model. It's just not a model we can use in sales right now. I can't read sixteen personalities. What I did, by the way, was for about three or four years uh, when I was doing a lot of keynotes, I had a very quick way of assessing people on screen. And so I would move them into corners. That's what I know people are listening going, what happened to compliant? What do you do with compliant? Uh, what happened was I was moving that for every hundred people, I was moving 30 into the dominant, 30 into the analytical, 30 social, and two people would be standing there in the compliant area. And I, so I, it's one of the reasons why I trimmed it down. But I actually just had these people just kept giving them assessments. And just like you said, I was just asking them of, of 40 analytical sitting next to each other, you know, running out of flip chart paper, <laughs> uh, but, but asking them, okay, how do you like to be this? What kind of question do you like here? And they taught me in a sense, as a group, here's the way we like to be communicated with. And so, um, and then, you know, just applying some nice sales ideas around that. But yeah, I, I just basically sectioned off rooms for about three or four years Till I had a nice sampling and um, kind of went from there. But yeah, I'm I'm a fan now. I understand it. I I fought it for about ten years. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it, which you know, I, and I feel like I, this has always been an area I could understand a lot better. I, if I could go back in time, I would definitely have, have majored in psychology because understanding the humans is is so important. And 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 you know whether you're managing people or selling to them. I mean, this this come, came up for me as being super important for managing people and because you manage people that different you got a, a great manager i think manages different people very very differently right. and a lot of it's it's based on them it's what's gonna help them succeed and help them grow and and yeah. you know the uh so you have to kind of feel just like in a sale you have to feel the person out and adapt yourself to to them so you can you know help them be the best they can be as, as a manager that's your whole job right to make people the best they can be absolutely um, uh, you know, I, I think coaches too. You know, that's why I said, I know people like I'm. I'm just a manager. I'm not selling. Yeah, you are. Okay, uh, but but even coaches. I was always a big fan of Pat Riley. I coached a lot of basketball, and I was always a fan of Pat Riley because you know he's coaching in L.A. in like the '80s or whatever it was with Magic and all, and they were Showtime. Then he coaches from New York, and it was just a brutal, physical, defensive team. Then he coached in Miami and it was sort of another hybrid. What you were watching was somebody who was assessing the talent that they had and trying to build a team around that and communicating to those people at different levels. The ones that have only one way of communicating, which is my way, uh, they don't sell well, they don't manage well, and they don't typically coach well either. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this plays out all across the board. Yeah, uh, absolutely. That, that makes a ton of sense. Well, and, and, uh, you know, and, and, and to your, to your point, I mean, everyone's in sales, right? Like if, if we, we had a woman on the podcast a while back, Cindy McGovern, who I thought made a ton of great points 
and I, I forget exactly what her book is called, but it's it's along the line. It's something like everyone's in sales or all of us sell or something like that. Like that's the Looks whole. For me. Yep. That's the whole point of her whole book. <laughs> it's, and uh, you know, I, I it's uh, it's something I think a lot of people don't realize, but we're all in sales. We we all go. Yeah. It, we, no, we I wrote. Just, a, I, oh, I'm sorry. On, sorry. Oh, go on. Yeah, I, I wrote an article one time because I, I also dissected. I, I'm like obsessed with this point, just so you know. And, uh, you know, why do people resist this? Why is it so, why is selling such a, you know, like a four letter bad word? And I also looked and I thought, you know, one of the other things that people don't like about selling and the reason why, oh, it's not a way well sell is because of commission. And then, and I wrote this piece one time and I said, I don't know how to break it to everybody, but we're all on commission. You don't think so? Uh, listen, I'm a salesperson. I get up in the morning. I'm, I have a given plan. That's my plan. That's the target I'm going after. And if I, if I meet that plan, I'm compensated. Uh, if I exceed that plan, I'm compensated. If I don't meet that plan, um, I'm going to be given, put on a, a pip of some sort and eventually asked to leave. Well, now I'm the person across the hallway. I, well, I don't like commission. I don't want me to like, okay. Uh, well, you basically have a job you need to do. If you meet expectations, you'll be paid. Uh, if you don't meet that expect those expectations, you'll be put on a performance improvement plan, and eventually you'll be asked to leave. But if you exceed those expectations, you will not be compensated for it. So, I really believe we should all embrace even the the, the most troubling part of sales, which is commission. Because I don't know about you, but I do wake up in the morning thinking I'm not out here to to meet expectations. I want to exceed them, and then I. I appreciate being compensated for it. Yeah. Well, and I also think people getting back to our, one of our earlier topics here, people avoid the career sales because they feel like it's a manipulative career path or like, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's not trustworthy or it's low integrity. And I, and, and I think in some cases it is, but I think it's rarer, rarer, Rarer than it is, than it isn't, right? So, and I think in, in cases where it is, I think you know, people should really think about other choices and other selling something else. Like if you're selling crappy used cars, maybe maybe don't do that. Right? So, yeah, exactly. It's like, good, it has nothing to do with the sales profession. It has to do with the dealership you signed on with. Right. Yeah. Right. And Fix it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the the uh, it, but yeah, it, it, you mentioned. Um, the concept of having natural talent in sales. Is it important to have natural sales confidence and charisma or can this, can, can sales be learned? Don't okay. fall, don't fall out of your chair. Don't fall. <laughs> there he is again. Uh, no, I, I, I love this question because, because, and if, if we haven't noticed in this last conversation, I don't sit on the sidelines a whole lot. you you may not agree with every point I have, but I'm a fairly opinionated guy. So says my wife. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a very strong opinion on this one. And I believe this to my core. Anyone can sell. Anyone. I don't care who you are. Now, we have to be careful we don't screw you up. Remember, we were talking about training. A lot of times, we these poor new hires, we product, product, product train them. Somebody calls it sales training. So we're basically teaching them not to ask questions and listen, just now that you know all about your product, go out and sell it. Oh, what does that mean? Okay, I'm going to spit back everything that we got. But the other issue that we have is we seem to think that there's some sort of, you know, perfect salesperson. You know, maybe it was Alec Baldwin and Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. You know, I'm frequently confused for Alec Baldwin myself, but that's other people I can't speak to this. But these are called jokes, ladies and gentlemen. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but I got to meet. Well, who I think is the greatest salesperson who ever lived. And I'm willing to bet that almost no one who hears this name will actually actually know him. But I think the greatest salesperson who ever lived was the great Ben Feldman. And Ben Feldman sold for the New York Life Insurance Company, my company. And I, um, I, and I got to meet him because I was nicknamed the rocket in the industry. And I had a couple good years, uh, but not like Ben Feldman. But let me tell you why I think Ben Feldman was the greatest. And I'm just going by numbers. In 1979, 1980, I'll tell you who number two was in the insurance industry. He sold about $50 million of insurance. Now, we're talking about New York Life 7,800 agents, but the whole industry, 
Mets 49,000, money's 45,000. Uh, I actually Googled it, about a quarter of a million salespeople. Number two was 50 million. Number three was 40, um, was 49 million. Number four was 48 and a half. I mean, it just begins to trickle down. Ben Feldman that year, $152 million of insurance sold. Now you think about that. How statistically can number one, triple number two in an industry of a quarter of a million people, well, we now know one thing. He had to be really good, and he was. But I had this image of, you know, the stereotypical salesperson, you know, this just bigger than life individual. I had lunch with him. Ben Feldman, who's no longer with us, Stood about five foot three. He had, he was a large fellow. We'll leave it at that. He had hair like Larry on the Three Stooges. And he spoke with a distinct lisp like this. Now, is that what you had in mind? And what that did for me at age 21, I had this epiphany. You know, after my first 15 seconds of that's him, was, oh, my goodness, their style and this technique. And we, we, we blur the lines, particularly with the mentors who frequently aren't making technique suggestions. They're talking about style. You need to dress this way. You need to add, add some humor into this conversation. Those are, those are style pieces. Technique is what you and I've been talking about on this call, asking open questions, sitting back and listen, don't introduce the problem early, drill down on the problem. That's technique. And so my, the reason why I'm comfortable answering the question of absolutely is Ben Feldman, as an example, may very well by the numbers have been the greatest salesperson who ever lived. And he didn't possess one attribute that people associate with great salespeople. Oh, and by the way, he sold in the sprawling metropolis of East Liverpool, Ohio. Yeah, I was, uh, so, was going to say, yeah. it's, it's not like he was selling in, uh, in New York. He was, I, I, no. I, 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 know, I know of him from being an Ohio guy, like I'm a Midwest ah. guy myself. And, and so he, he, was doing, he did this in Ohio somehow. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, so, but he's also, he's known for, uh, for like values selling, right? Like he said, he, like he sold life insurance and he was like, I don't sell life insurance. I sell, I sell dollars. And I, I sell, sell peace of mind. Yeah, like he, you know, he said yep. something about like I sell dollars for pennies a piece, and it, it, my uh, I sell you a dollar for three cents per year, and, uh, and it was it was something along those lines, right? So it was like it was the here is the value you get from the thing that yep. I do, you know. He, but he very, but he committed to who he was. He didn't try and be somebody else. And if, you know, so when we've got people, maybe you're listening who are, who are introverts. So we have people that don't necessarily consider themselves having the gift of gab, whatever it is, you commit to who you are. No one can do a better imitation of who you are. You learn your product. You believe in that product. You learn solid sound sales techniques. Don't change one thing about your style and you will be a success. Fantastic advice. Well, I've got a few quick questions, quick answers for you. All right, let's um, roll. So what are some mistakes you made as a salesperson that inform your books and your trainings today? Mistakes I made is funny. I always have very quick answers. Mistakes. That's very challenging for me to come up with. I think one of the mistakes that I made, and, and you know, um, I spoke to Tom Ziegler, Zig Ziegler's son, and he mentioned this. And I thought, boy, same thing. He was, he was at the table with a lot of very impressive people, um, but he wasn't as careful about maintaining, as Tom says, the connections with those people. I think one of the mistakes that I would love to go back, and, and I'm going to be celebrating 30 years on my own now as a professional speaker, 10 more with Xerox. If I could go back, I would tap uh, Rob Jollis 30 years ago and say, you do a better job of maintaining those connections. And yes, these people are going to retire or they're going to move on, but somebody's going to take their position and there will be an introduction if you are there maintaining this. But if not, you're going to wake up someday. And a lot of these contacts are going to, who are your age, are going to begin to retire or be retired or whatever. And I, I would have been a little more meticulous about that. Never answered that, never been asked that question and never answered that way. So that's a scoop. Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. And something we could we could all do better to 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 tend to our gardens a little better. Yeah. yeah. Um, how has sales changed since your over the course of your career? All right, I'll be quicker on this one. I know these are supposed to be speed answers. Uh, 
But uh, here's the funny thing. I don't think the fundamentals have changed all that much. I'm not being old school with you. I still think we need to ask questions and listen. Guy handed me a book one time from 1913. It was an insurance pamp book of something. I think it was for Northwest Insurance or something. Page one. Yeah, ask questions and listen. I don't think it's changed as much. I think obviously there are more virtual opportunities. I think technology has changed around us and we should embrace. I'm not a guy who's you know telling people to get off my yard. I'm embracing as much technology as I can. I think LinkedIn is a very important tool that is that continues to progress and be a very smart tool. I'm sorry to say, folks, you won't find me really much on Instagram. I really don't like tweeting. I, you know, but I take my LinkedIn garden fairly seriously. So um, I think those are some of the changes. It's more of the technology around it. Yeah, it, it's funny. LinkedIn's the only one I use too. And, and a, a, a lot of like, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't see a lot of value that Snapchat brings to the world. <laughs> just, but yeah, that's just, that's just for me. I know a lot, a lot of people feel different. But uh, I, uh, well, so what, what, uh, what's a mistake inexperienced sellers often make? Oh, good. It's not on me. This is easy. <laughs> uh, a mistake. I think that they uh, believe they're, they're listening when they're not. I think they believe that there's an even conversation going on when there isn't. And I actually, I don't take them around anymore, but I used to, I invested in about 40 chess clocks at one point. And just to prove to people that, uh, and if you haven't seen a chess clock, I'm not a great chess player, but it's basically two clocks and depends on which plunger is going down as to which clock's going down. And I, when I was coaching or working with different teams, I'd say, okay, I know that you have that conversation, but I want that plunger down every time you're talking. And I want the plunger down every time the client's talking. And people were kind of amazed at how, how much they were dominating the conversation. So I do believe that, um, you know, th- that's just a nice, fundamental, easy fix. Just keep remembering, put it up on the wall somewhere. The more the client talks, the more they like you. Don't lose sight of that. Yeah. Talk less, listen more. And you, you, know, you can actually have a chess clock on your phone. Great little sales. Yeah. Tool. You just run on your phone while you're on the, if you're, especially if you're like on the phone with someone, it's easy to do, but you can like, you know, they won't, yeah. they won't know that you, but you can keep track of yourself, test yourself a few times. How often am I talking off? And I, are they talking? Just look up a chess clock. You can, little apps on your phone. You, it's an app on your phone for free. That you can, I actually have that app. And I just, about two weeks ago, I, I, tragically, I was sort of sobbed, not really sobbed, but I was really upset. I threw out all my chess clocks. Oh, no. <laughs> my wife made me. Well, they were taking up too much room. But uh, I did. I threw out all my chess clocks because there's an app for it, as you said. And it's just easier that way. Yeah. Um, what's something that everyone should do daily as a salesperson to be more successful? You know, it's really going to depend on your product. But, but my dad once told me, because you know, everyone's like, oh, cold calling, terrible cold calling. But my dad once told me, you know, cold call is like shaving. You do a little bit of it each day. And so I'm not telling you to cold call every day. I'm saying whatever it is on that board that you really don't like doing, but you know it's an important part or it's, a, it's an element of prospecting, do it. Um, and the second thing is um, from an entrepreneur is keep feeding that pipeline. Keep feeding that pipeline. I don't care how good the year's going. Keep going. Keep, keep filling that pipeline uh, because I don't know about you, but I, I don't win every sale uh, and I can take it pretty well if I got a full pipeline. But when my pipeline's anemic, I tend to tighten up just like everybody else on the call. Words that normally come easier are a little bit harder to find because that pipeline is empty. So I think we fall in love with the fact that we've got a good year going and we've got a good client on the line. Don't lose sight of the pipeline. Just keep going. Keep filling that pipeline. So true. Well, and it makes you a better negotiator if you, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot of people find themselves in a constant cycle of needing to drag everything into this quarter when, you know, and, and doing crazy things to, to win things this quarter when really if they had a thicker pipeline, they, they'd be able to let the thing close at its natural pace and close next quarter and get more money for it or not discount it or, you know, um, have, have it go better, not have to do unnatural things. Yeah. I love what you just said, by the way, I, I'm the podcaster in me loves to pull stuff that you just said it. I, and I've never said it that way. You will be a better negotiator. 
because it isn't life or death whether you make this sale. And so when that element is removed, you're a lot more confident. And I, I can I can't promise you, but I can with a lot of confidence tell you, you're going to be a good negotiator, and you're still going to get the deal. You're just going to get a better deal. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm going to try to quickly summarize the uh, the stuff that we've that we've said here. Good luck with that. Yeah, <laughs> just going to pluck some good stuff for the people that can't take notes because they're they're in the car here. Um, so intent is the difference between influence and manipulation. So think of why you're doing what you do and, and don't push clients into decisions that you wouldn't want to make yourself. Salespeople can be both successful and ethical. Trust is a must in sales, but it's really difficult to create. And there, there, there it's, it's difficult. It, it's hard to have a, an easy process to repeat around it because it's different every time. Right. And, um, you know, it, you have to figure out what are the four questions that show that you, you really care about someone, but they're going to be different almost every time. So it's, it, it's, uh, you really got to listen. Pitch and cadence are important when communicating with prospects and customers. The, you know, the, uh, you described it as the tune of the, of the, of the pitch. Tune of the uh, conversation. Yeah. Uh, tune of the conversation. Yeah. I, I really like that. I've never heard that before. In order to be authentic, make sure that um, you are 100% accepting what your branding is and 100% believe in your product. Because if you can't believe, in, if you don't believe in your product, it's, you, you're, you're not going to be able to come across uh, as, as being trustworthy and, and authentic. People don't naturally fix small problems. They fix big problems. Um, you want to act like a friend and ask questions about their problems and, and find ways to create urgency um, based on how important it is, right? So you you uh, you want to show them that this is a, the biggest problem when they stack rank things on, you know, one to 20 of the list of things to do. You want your problem to be number three and you want to figure out why is your problem a big problem and not a small problem by understanding them, understanding their business. Take time to walk in your prospect's shoes and really empathize with them. Um, you know, basically say, say either to yourself or in some way to them, Hey, everybody's got a story. I'd love to hear yours and, uh, different personality types are going to respond differently to that. But, you know, really, e even if it's someone who d doesn't like to chit chat, you can, you through, through discussion and questioning and listening, you can really discover where someone's coming from. You want to understand their business, understand their product, understand their customers. You want to have a full understanding of where their head is at and where their business is at before you get into your problems, the, the, in, into the problems that you solve for them, and certainly before you get into the, the features and speeds and feeds of your product. After you understand a client's problem, uh, you can try to do a trial close, test the waters. You can ask, are you committed to making a change? Or you can ask, do you think now's the time to, to look at a few solutions to this? You want to pay attention and you want to adapt to your prospect's personality and communication style. So, you know, Robert, this has been a, an absolutely fantastic uh, discussion. Where can our listeners read more about your work? How do they reach out to you? What's the best place to learn more from you? Yeah, thank you. I think the easiest way is just www.jolles.com because there you'll see these articles I write. Yes, I own that word, blog articles. I've been doing that for 13 years, one every other week. They're killing me, these blog articles. Uh, all the podcasts are there as well as iTunes, Spotify, things like that. But uh, just more me, business, you want to contact me, all that stuff. I just think it's easier just to go there. It's all there. Fantastic. Well, this has been a great episode of the Outside Sales Talk. If you work in field sales, you'll love Badger Maps. The number one route planner helps you sell 20% more, drive 20% less. You can get a free trial at badgermapping.com today. If you can think of any other sales reps that would benefit from learning the skills that Robert has generously shared with us today, definitely share the love and forward this episode along to them. Uh, Robert, I really appreciate you coming on the show today. Uh, it was my pleasure. I enjoyed it. We could have gone another hour if you could have handled it. <laughs> <laughs> if people if people can handle listening to us, right? <laughs> well, it's an absolute pleasure and thanks for coming. Take care until next time, everybody.